hi there i'm christine weber welcome to my weekly live stream um today i'm going to be talking a little bit about the endocrine system and the uh, relationship between yoga and the endocrine system so um that is something that we are studying in depth right now in my um, membership group which is called the subtle yoga resilience society um, such great people. I feel so fortunate to work with so many of the people that are in, part of the society because they're incredible. There a lot of them are doing great work, many yoga teachers, lots of people who aren't yoga teachers, but are great people. Um, so if you're interested, please check it out. I've, I've, I've added a link. Okay, so today I wanna to just do a brief little chat about the endocrine system and um, specifically we're gonna talk about, we're, I'm gonna talk a little bit about the traditional connection between the endocrine system and the chakras, a la yoga, the yoga uh, uh, tradition. But I also want to talk about some of the science behind what goes on in your muscles. It's a little different than um, than the previous understandings of the endocrine system. So previously, we went, understood that we have these glands, like the thyroid or your pancreas or your adrenaline glands, up to a teri. And that these were the, you know, these are the glands that control the hormone activity in the body. And so the yogis understood about, they understood glands. They actually called them nodal points, N-O-D-A-L. And they understood that they had a specific relationship to the mind, right? Um, and that, for example, I mean, we know it because you know, there's, there's an effect on the mind when your blood sugar is low. Some people call it being hangry, right? Hungry plus angry, like, oh, I got to eat something because I'm feeling grumpy, right? Um, but we also know that, for example, women have a, a very intimate knowledge of how the fluctuating hormones of our menstrual cycle affect the mind. There's strong correlations between low thyroid and depression. So all of these things have been well established in medical literature. Um, the yogis kind of intuited it as well. And many, many of the yoga practices are actually developed to balance the hormone system. Um, many of them. And, and that was sort of the original intention, you could say, of, of yoga practices. Now, there have been lots of people, I just want to make sure I speak to the naysayers because there's a lot have been lots of people and I've seen this being written and over the past 10 years or so who say that, um, first of all, they say chakras don't exist. They're just interoceptive maps that we create in our body by doing Nyasa practice, which is, you know, like a um, mantra, for example, and like you place it in certain parts of your body. Uh, Christopher Wallace, if you're familiar with his work, is a big one who talks about the chakras really not being having any kind of phenomenological existence but being places that we focus on in meditation and be that as it may there are researchers like shamini jane who's a physician like candace pert who studied site who was one of the founders of psychoneuroimmunology who actually said there, there are physical correlates in the body so the jury is still out on that. Um, I'm a little bit more on the Candace Perch, Shimini Jane, and Hiroshimoto Yama side of things, because those were all people that, even though they're not, you know, they were like, they're a little bit different than regular scientists. They have, I don't know what a regular scientist is, but they have a little bit more expansive perspective, as you could say, than some of the scientists. Um, but I, I think that their work has been really interesting for informing our understanding of a phenomenological, like a an actual existence of an energy field associated with a certain bodily region. And then there's other people, like, and these are, tend to be people in the yoga community like Christopher Wallace. I've also heard Gary Craftso talk about, um, you know, these are just these are just symbol systems. They're not real. So people have different ideas about it. That's just fine. I don't want to just discount either of them and say that that you know and say that there's just one right way to understand this. But I also will not discount the fact that science has um, often started to corroborate the wisdom of the yogis. And I think that's probably going to continue to happen. Okay. So all that being said, like endocrine system, even if we don't, even if we don't believe in chakras, the endocrine system, we have to believe in this part of ourselves. And even if we don't believe 
that, uh, you know, chakras have any effect on our emotions, the endocrine system does. And we know that as human beings, I'm doing this on my hand because we know there's these midline structures where we tend to feel emotions and we have so many idioms in the language. I loved him with all my heart. I felt all choked up. Oh, that's so confusing. It gives me a headache. And there's butterflies in my stomach. Like we go on and on about that midline experience of, of emotions. And the yogis were quite uh, focused and clear on the idea that, um, that our emotional um, uh, balance is quite dependent on, these, on the physicality, on whether or not the uh, endocrine structures are balanced, right? They were very clear about that. So, uh, you know, that there's just to do one more naysayer thing, <laughs> there's other people who say, oh, it's just back in the 1920s, they started to discover endocrine glands. And so that's why all that stuff got glommed onto the chakra system. Okay, that may, there may be some accuracy in that. But again, the, there was some uh, intuition, there was some understanding that there was a connection that existed before the um, discovery, the anatomical discoveries of these glands. Okay, now that's just a little bit about like history of chakras and glands and balancing the mind and all that stuff. And the thing that I think is interesting in the past 20 years or so is that um, science has started to, do, to understand that there is endocrine activity going on in other places in the body. And the myofascia system is one of those important places. So. They, they know that there is something going on in terms of endocrine activity in the myofascia, in the fascia, as well as the myo, the muscles, right? And today I want to talk about what specifically is understood about the muscles and endocrine activity. So there is, um, first of all, a certain cytokine that's produced in the muscles. Uh, we all know about cytokines because of COVID, right? And you heard people talking about cytokine storms a lot during COVID, like people would have this insane inflammatory, pro-inflammatory response to that, the horrible um, uh, uh, virus that we were exposed to, right? So, and that would be this, this like crazy inflammatory response to your immune system trying to get rid of the virus, right? That's a cytokine. A myokine is that your muscle produces a kind of cytokine. They're little bits of protein. They um, can be like kind of uh, uh, in a cell. And so myokines are going to produce a slightly inflammatory response, right? And you can think about that. Like, for example, if you're doing, like say one day you did a lot of down dog. And the next day you felt like a little soreness and inflammation, right? You might've felt like a little bit of whatever. Has that ever happened to you after yoga? <laughs> right? It's way too many chaturangas or whatever. And then you feel this little bit of soreness and the muscles, a little bit of soreness. That's um, a, an inflammatory response. And it may be, and, and it's good for you, by the way. Inflammation is good. Inflammation is not bad unless it's systemic. Short-term inflammation is good because now your body's going, I got to figure this out. What am I going to do to figure this out? And so what the scientists have discovered is that um, anti-inflammatory substances are released as a result of that physical movement and exercise. And one of the important anti-inflammatories is IL-6, interleukin-6 which has been shown to have really beautiful anti-inflammatory properties. And that may go beyond, you know, just healing the inflammation from your down dog, right? It goes, it's more, a little more systemic. Um, so like that little bit of stress, you know, it has a little bit of, you could even say damage or inflammation that then causes a healing response. It's like activating the innate healing response of the system. So that's a beautiful thing, uh, as long as it's not overdone, but do, done slowly over time, we're creating stronger immune system, we're creating a more anti-inflammatory um, environment for, for the body. So movement, so, so important, as we know, and what's so beautiful about yoga is we move our body in all sorts of crazy different ways, and it has you know this very positive effect. The other thing that, um, uh, scientists have discovered is that there is a, another uh, hormone. Let me just make sure I get the name right. I wrote it down for you. It's called irisin, I believe. I just want to make sure I get it right um, and not, not pronounce it in, inappropriately or inaccurately. 
Yes, it is called irisin. I hope I'm pronouncing that properly. If I'm not, let me know in the comments. But irisin is a um, an, another, uh, or is it, in fact, it's a hormone. That, so the endocrine system and the immune system work together. And in fact, scientists often refer to the system as neuroendocrine immune because the nervous system is also involved, right? So anyway, uh, uh, irisin is actually a hormone that's produced in the muscles. So here we go. The muscles are having endocrine activity. They produce a hormone. This hormone called irisin has an effect on uh, converting the white fat cells to brown fat cells. Why is that relevant? Because brown fat cells are better at uh, metabolism. They're better at burning uh, burning calories. They're better at helping us to process, uh, you know, um, the, for this, you know, helping the metabolism to work better in general. Um, and so that, and that's produced again, due to exercise. We want to shift the white black cells into uh, blood cells into the, uh, did I say blood cells, the white fat cells into the brown fat cells. And that's one of the effects of, of moving the body of, of using the muscles. So these are just some of the sort of um, at some of the rabbit hole going down to, into of why yoga is um, more than musculoskeletal, right? And why musculoskeletal is more than musculoskeletal. <laughs> you know? it's because uh, I think we get stuck, yes, we get so stuck in the yoga world on how am I going to stretch this muscle and how am I going to strengthen that muscle? And we get so sort of hyper-focused on that stuff. And the fitness world does that, that we're missing some of the more global and holistic benefits. We, there's strong evidence, there's strong evidence in the research literature that exercise works as well as antidepressants for many people, not for everybody, not for uh, major depressive disorder, but for many people with depressive, episodic depressive symptoms, uh, there's strong research evidence that exercise works as well. And now we're starting to uncover the mechanisms. We're starting to understand why. And part of that reason why is what I was just explaining to you about the myokines and the um, and the irisin, the hormones that get produced in the muscles when we do a lot of movement. And now we can take that into our understanding of how the hormones affect our moods. This is what the yogis have been talking about for decades, if not centuries, if not longer. That why do you do asana? You do asana to balance the mind. What does it mean to balance the mind? It means that these emotions that can pull us around like we're a, you know, a, just a, a flag in the wind um, you know, a piece of a piece of laundry on the clothesline. Emotions do that, and you have the capacity by using these practices of yoga to to have more sense of choice and balance, more ability to balance that and those emotional states. That's the benefit of these practices, as much as your hamstrings, as much as your, you know, anything else. And and I think when we start to have a more holistic appreciation, a more holistic understanding, then we have more appreciation of the practices. We understand the value of these practices in a more holistic way, just how human beings work. We are holistic. We are not discrete systems. You know, we're holistic systems. The mind and the body are one. We break them up to understand them, but they're one. So I want to thank you so much for joining me. I would appreciate it if you would leave a comment. Um, and I would also appreciate it if you check out the link I provided in the description of this video, which is about the um, Subtle Yoga Resilience Society. The Resilience Society is really, you know, my, my whole um, idea behind it is to help people to learn the, the depth of these practices, to understand the neurobiologic mechanisms behind these practices and be able to practice with a sense of confidence that you are doing something for yourself to self-regulate. If you're a yoga teacher, that you are learning how to explain the mechanisms to your students so that they can really benefit from these practices. Thank you so much for being here. I'll see you next week. Lots of love.